Good evening and welcome to Affordable Housing Matters. A rising issue in the New Orleans area is housing affordability. Is there affordable housing? Is there reliable housing? Tonight we assess the impact that our local, federal, and state governments have on our affordable housing market and with elections looming this fall, what can prospective candidates do to help affordability in our area? We have a great show planned tonight, so don't go far. A new team, new editorial resources. The same objective analysis of the top business news of the day. Every weeknight, complete market coverage. With the business and economic stories that are crucial to you. Nightly business report. Weeknights at 5.30 p.m. on WLAE. Dr. Ed Shevernak is the director of the UNO Survey Research Center and local analyst of political and social trust. Tonight, he is here to explain to us why he believes affordable housing will be an issue that the next mayor will have to confront. Dr. Shevernak, welcome to Affordable Housing. Thanks for having me, Norman. You're welcome. Uh, why is affordable housing a big issue for the next mayor? Well, uh, it's actually an issue for this mayor. Um, he's already put out a plan to deal with affordable housing. He wants to construct 7,500 affordable housing units by the year 2021. Uh, and it's not just an issue here in New Orleans. This is an issue that's happening in every major urban center in America. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, a process what's known as gentrification, um, which basically means that it's an upgrade of core neighborhoods that occurs when individuals, primarily uh, young single people or childless couples, come in and basically look at a neighborhood as a good buy, purchase the house, renovate it, and refurbish the neighborhood it, with the effort of trying to bring that neighborhood back. The problem, obviously, is that while there are benefits to that in terms of increased property values and increased tax revenues for the city, uh, that the longtime residents end up being displaced uh, and that uh, once they get displaced, and then, of course, with this kind of push to renovate houses, that means the, the number of rentals begins to shrink, and that means rents go up. And so you may get displaced out of a neighborhood mm -hmm. and then be forced to pay higher rent in another neighborhood. And so that's, that's the real problem. That's what critics point out, the problem of gentrification Sounds is. like a catch-22. Yes, you, that this is me. something that all cities confront, is that they want economic development, they want to bring in these, these young entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. they, and they, you know, they want to increase the tax revenue. But at the same time, there are people who do get left behind and do get displaced. And so this is why it's a real concern um, that about I think it's 37% of the New Orleanians pay at least half of their yes. monthly income just to rent. Rents have gone up like 50%, but wages obviously have not. Wages are not keeping up, particularly in a service industry-based economy like we have in New Orleans. Wages just aren't matching the increase in rents. And so cities have to provide some sort of programs that can offer these affordable housing units to people who are working in the service industry or even in education, teachers, public or police officers, mm -hmm. firefighters, uh, people who are not necessarily making a whole lot of money. Is this going to be a defining issue for the next mayor? Uh, it seems that crime is pretty much the defining issue right now. Okay. Every forum that I attend, uh, you know, um, that crime is always the dominant issue. How does affordable housing play into this crime uh, dynamic? Well, uh, certainly if, if the economy grows and people have opportunity, then they're not going to be going out there and knocking people on the heads, mm -hmm. you know, stealing their wallets and, and their cell phones. And so uh, this is what Latoya Cantrell has been pointing out. Is she's, what her phrase was, nothing stops a bullet like a job. Right. That in, offer opportunities, get people employed, um, then that should help reduce crime. Um, but of course, um, there's always that trade-off that not everyone is going to succeed. There's going to be winners and there are going to be losers. Um, and so, so the, what the city attempts to do is balance that out and help some of the people who are left behind by providing set-asides for these developers. We, we, uh, the mayor's pushing what's known as this inclusionary zoning. Mm -hmm. 
that which get uh, which got some pushback. Yes, um, primarily from the state. Yes. Yeah, the, mm. the the state wants to ban inclusionary zoning, and what inclusionary zoning means is that uh, developers get a a density bonus if they agree to set aside, say, 12% of their units for people who are at, say, median income levels. Yeah. Um, so they can, get, they can build more units and set aside these units, like 12%, and do so for a long period of time, for at least 50 years. Um, we saw what As opposed to the 15 years that American, American Can. American Company, right. Yeah. But that was a different period of time when they, the, the city was desperate for development. And so they offered them those, those tax-exempt bonds and said, you know, we'll hold mm -hmm. you to this for 15 years. Uh, we saw what the result of that was, is that people did get displaced after that 15-year period was up. So now what the thinking is, is you extend that period now to 50 years so that people don't get tossed out um, as a result of that particular phase ending. So the question uh, now is, did the current mayor make affordable housing uh, better or worse? Uh, he's in, it's still in the kind of formulation phase. The City Planning Commission hasn't really approved of this inclusionary zoning, mm -hmm. so it's still a work in progress. And it'll probably continue to be a work in progress even for the next mayor, um, because uh, as you know, we have to get it through the City Council, has to go through the City Planning Commission. Um, you have to worry about the state. You, know, you don't want the state banning inclusionary zones, so that means the New Orleans delegation has to make sure that that doesn't happen. So it's still a work in progress, um, and uh, it, it's not going to be fixed overnight, obviously. This is something that takes, you know, building housing and, and creating housing, affordable housing that takes time, uh, and it takes money. So in the meantime, you have people clamoring for some um, resolution, some relief. Yes. But they can't expect anything in the near future. Well, there, you know, there's probably going to be some uh, affordable housing coming online, but my understanding is that for um, every 100 residents who need affordable housing, there's only about 47 units available. Wow. So, uh, and this comes from uh, the Enterprise uh, Community Partners. This is a national nonprofit that deals with affordable housing. And so, you know, demand is probably always going to exceed supply. So I don't think this problem is going to go away anytime soon. Uh, and if gentrification continues, um, that, you know, that means more people will be displaced. That means there'll be a greater need for affordable housing units. So uh, it's, it's hard. It's not, I don't think it's going to be resolved anytime soon. Is there any reason to expect that gentrification won't continue? Uh, you know, absent a, com a collapse of the market, um, you know, something like 2008 when the, you know, the mortgage industry collapsed. Mm -hmm. um, that would probably bring a halt to gentrification because it would be almost impossible. So it would, it would be something that drastic. That would probably be something that drastic, or you know, some sort of policy that would be passed by cities um, that would basically say, well, you know, if you're going to, you know, gentrification, they may, you know, slap certain fees on people who want to move into these particular neighborhoods. So there are things that cities that want, can do, but I doubt that they're going to do them. They want gentrification. They want these housing units to be upgraded. They want these neighborhoods to be upgraded because this is how you attract new people mm -hmm. to, to move into your city and bring jobs in, this, this entrepreneurial class. But it seems to be at the expense of the old people yes. getting rid of the people that made the city what it is. Yes, that's the problem. That's what critics point out is that these people get displaced. And that, you know, there's concerns, particularly here in New Orleans, about uh, the loss of culture you know, with this influx yes. of new people, that they're displacing people who historically have contributed to New Orleans culture in terms of music, in ter terms of cuisine, entertainment. And there's a fear that something might be lost as a result of gentrification. Is that a very real fear? Um, you know, it, it seems, you know, I'm a transplant. And, okay. and I have New Orleans in my blood. And mm -hmm. I've tried to embrace everything about New Orleans. And, you know, following the locals' leads um, about how to behave and, and to be a New Orleanian. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that a lot of people who do move here do socially incorporate the culture. Um, you know, I have a friend, I, I grew up in Ohio, and I had a friend up there, and he says, how can you live in New Orleans? And I says, the only way you can live there is if you embrace the culture. Because exactly. otherwise, 
uh, you just can't live here. <laughs> You're just going to be a misfit. And so I think, you know, I, I know initially that sometimes there are, there's conflict between the new people who are coming in and, mm -hmm. and the settled residents, say, in terms of second lines coming through the neighborhood yes. or, or midnight basketball. Mm -hmm. And so there can be some conflict. But I think eventually people do, in fact, they follow the locals' leads and they do incorporate and they do embrace this culture. So save from crime, affordable housing is definitely... One of the key issues. Oh yes, absolutely. It is key. It is a key issue um, because people are being harmed by this. That you know there are benefits. It's, you know there's two sides of the same coin. There are benefits, but at the same time, people are being are being harmed, being displaced, um, outpriced. You know, basically, you know, if you're running a house and the landlord says I'm kicking you out, you're out, and you really have no place to go. Uh, and if you do find some place, it's going to be higher rent. So people are being harmed, and so it is going to be an issue. Um, it, it, right now, it's being drowned out by the crime issue. Um, but uh, you know, I would suspect that there are going to be people who are going to be uh, questioning these candidates about their positions on affordable housing um, because it is a real issue. Dr. Ed Shevernak, thank you very much. Thank you. You're very welcome. Right after this break, we will be joined by the Greater New Orleans Housing Alliance to learn about the Housing NOLA 10-year strategy and implementation plan that was put in place to ensure 33,600 additional affordable housing units in the city by the year 2025. More to come, so please stay tuned. I love taking care of my mom. It wasn't easy at first. She learned how to better communicate her needs. And you learned how to not ignore yours. I discovered how to make healthier meals. And I discovered how much I enjoyed them. Becoming a caregiver is a learning experience for everyone. Find articles, tips, and tools from experts and others who have been in your place. The Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. Ms. Andronisha Morris is the Executive Director for Housing NOLA, a 10-year partnership between the Greater New Orleans Housing Alliance, the Foundation for Louisiana, the City's Office of Housing and Community Development. She is joining me now to tell us about the Housing NOLA 10-year strategy and implementation plan that she spearheaded in December of 2015. Ms. Morris? Thank you for having me, Norman. Welcome, welcome. Glad to have you. Listen, what is the Housing NOLA 10-year strategy. So Housing NOLA is a public-private partnership where we work with community leaders and government officials and everybody in between to discuss the, the affordable housing crisis that the city has um, found itself in. In 2014, we started a one-year um, planning process. We released the plan. Last year, we issued our first report card, and this year, we're getting ready to issue our second report card. Uh, and we're also... Um, managing the upcoming elections um, and engaging around this. This mayor's office has been incredibly supportive. Mm -hmm. um, you don't normally find that with housing plans. You either get this, you, you, normally you have a housing plan where it's the government's plan or you have a housing plan that's the community's plan. What we have managed to put together is this hybrid where the community is absolutely at the table. They have the final word, mm -hmm. but it is done through negotiation with the city, with the other private, with the other public partners like the housing authority, the redevelopment authority, the state housing agency, to make sure that what community is demanding is possible. Mm -hmm. With that being said, what are your concerns about the upcoming mayoral elections? That we lose ground. Uh, like as I said, this mayor's office has been incredibly supportive. We've gotten the support of the governor's office because we had a plan in place, and we want to make sure that the next mayor, we want to that they understand that we have to put housing first and mm -hmm. that uh, this community has laid out a strategy to solve this problem. And we need this mayor to honor that commitment and to expand on it where possible. So you have uh, 18 candidates running for mayor. Yes. Obviously, um, only one of them will end up as There can as, be only one. Yes, <laughs> as mayor. Is there any particular candidate that you're looking at 
um, that you might have some concerns about? Not yet. We are releasing the, uh, we released the platform. So that happened on Saturday, July 29th. We released mm -hmm. the platform. That's going to be delivered to each candidate, candidate's uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to be evaluating them based on their voting records, based on the things that they have said. We're going to give them the opportunity to come in and explain themselves. And then we're going to rank all of the candidates, not just for mayor, but for city council mm -hmm. and for assessor, because those are the nine positions that have the opportunity, the ability, and the frankly, the mandate uh, and the requirement to put housing first. Now, let's break down your plan. Uh, let's talk about preserving the existing supply and expand and the total supply of affordable housing, rental, and home ownership opportunities throughout the city. So that's twofold. Number one, we can't just build our way out of this. Mm -hmm. um, the analysis shows uh, almost 60% of our renters are cost burdened, spending more than 30% of their income. Almost 40% of the people who rent in the city spend more than half of their income on their housing costs. It's not sustainable. It's, it's not sustainable for this community. So we want to make sure we're not, we can't just build our way out of it. We can't just build thousands of new homes and apartments. A number of people want to stay in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so we, that's what we mean when we say preserve affordability. We mean give you the opportunity to stay if your neighborhood starts to strengthen, revitalize, new investments are coming in. You should get to benefit from that. And there is a need to build, right? There is, um, it's particularly um, subsidized units, subsidized homes and apartments for the folks who are at the low end of the spectrum. There's just not enough market rate uh, and it's not enough subsidy out there to, to get the market rate units to where they need to be. So we need to build more truly affordable um, houses and apartments. And not just for people, make, people making $7.25. Recent study got released saying that you need to make about $62,000 a year wow. to, to live comfortably in the city of New Orleans. So what, what is the average... Um, Medi area median income in the median income yeah. in New Orleans is thirty nine thousand dollars. So that's uh, almost twice that. Yes, you have to make almost twice that. And so that means again, it bears out the numbers that we've always we've seen. That it continues to um, this data every data point that we see continues to reinforce the, the need for this plan. So how, how do you problem. reconcile that? How do you reconcile that disparity? Uh, we talk about the gross inequities in the city. We talk about the fact that we haven't intervened deliberately. That's what was ho that was housing NOLA's mandate mm -hmm. to come up with a strategy and to get everyone's collective buy-in. And that's why this election is so important because this work must continue. We saw several months ago people being uh, on the verge of being displaced or evicted from American Can. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? So there's a number of strategies. We've got the Smart Housing Mix Ordinance, which would allow for when we make investments. The city of New Orleans has got to be smarter. American Can was done 15 years ago with a lot of public funding. And the city, frankly, at that time, the administration at that time, did not get an adequate return on its investment. The city moving forward, this mayor has committed that no public investment will be made without uh, market rate developers, affordable housing developers adequately meeting this crisis. The next mayor has to hold to that, that commitment and expand on it, frankly. We've got to draw some hard lines in the sand and not allow for development for the sake of development, right? There's a, there's a notion that goes out there saying, you know, cranes in the sky are good, but when you look at that kind of trickle-down mm -hmm. economic thinking, it's never worked, and it doesn't work in New Orleans. I know that um, there was some great concern that um, some members of the legislature were listening to private developers yep. uh, during the last session yes. about doing away with some of the mixed income subsidy programs. Yeah, they, what they wanted to do was um, Senator Conrad Appel actually introduced a bill, got it through the Senate, um, and it, got it, it was defeated on the House side, House side thankfully. Um, uh, great support from the New Orleans uh, delegation, but also we got support from Lake Charles, Shreveport, Baton Rouge. People recognize, because this is a crisis across the state, New Orleans mm -hmm. is feeling it in the most extreme, but the state of Louisiana has about 200,000 citizens who are also cost burdened. So this isn't just New Orleans. Uh, so what Conrad, Abel, uh, Conrad Appel's bill called for was stopping cities like New Orleans mm -hmm. from implementing the smart housing mix which would require that developers create affordable housing when they build any residential um, projects of a certain size. How concerned are you that the developers will try that, this same tactic 
during the next legislative session. Very concerned. That's why this is an ordinance that's been studied by the City Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. We need to get the City Council uh, and the Mayor's Office to move forward and get this implemented before the next legislative session. It's going to be harder for them to do that state preemption when there's an existing, um, there's an existing policy, there's an existing um, program that's being run successfully out of a city. With all these potential roadblocks being put up, um, is it compounded then by the, the issue of fair housing? Absolutely. And that's that's so? another issue. Well, because one of the things we're talking about with the smart housing mix mm -hmm. is giving folks the chance to live near their jobs, live in communities where investment's being made, uh, because that benefits everyone. It benefits their employers, it benefits the schools, it benefits the, those families. And so that's part of when we, when we talk about fair housing, we mean giving people the chance to live in strong communities, giving them access to equal opportunity, and not consigning them to um, you know, far-flung parts of the city where they don't have access to transit, where the schools are not that great, um, where there's crime. Well, um, and again, and that prevents them from being successful. Now, we want to see those communities also become stronger. So this isn't just about, we can't just move everyone around and put everyone in the best neighborhoods in the city. All, those neighborhoods that are also suffering need to be strengthened. And that means strategic investment, but not being so short-sighted that we don't take advantage of opportunities that are right here. Someone wants to build a 200-unit um, and they've got the money, 200 unit apartment complex for high end renters. And that's not what we need. We need mm -hmm. to talk about how they get what they want and the city gets what it needs. So how is this all going to, um, um, shape, shape out when you talk about, um, this area being a hot market right. when it comes to, um, construction and, and housing and condos. Right and hotels and you want to preserve the um the stability of people's neighborhoods but you have all of these people looking at these potential mm -hmm. um developments that will be uh how should you say market enhancing for them and yep. increase their portfolio and what's going to stop them from going in and just taking over and gentrifying these areas and pushing these people out well, that's where these kind of policies have to, you know, they have to be implemented. That's what's going to stop them. Frankly, the market, this, the, the hotness of the market is starting to taper off, and we are heading for a full-on crisis, a, a crash. Really? So, we, so, so we're looking at oh, a, the, the possibility I, that this is, hold, this bubble is going to burst. It's absolutely. This isn't sustainable. 60% of renters are cost burden. It takes $62,000 to live comfortably. The average median income in the city of New Orleans is $39,000. The math doesn't work. This is not sustainable long term. And so if we don't intervene, it is in the developer's best interest. And the Greater New Orleans Housing Alliance is a coalition of developers mm -hmm. who get that, who recognize that we can deflate the bubble. I, this is where I usually make a joke about you know, Tom Brady um, helping us learn how to defa deflate things. <laughs> <laughs> And I get booed by Saints fans. Oh, but of course, yes. yes. <laughs> because, but, uh, but that's what we need. It's, we're not talking about interfering in people's business practices. We're not talking about stopping developers from making money. We're talking about a win-win for everyone. If you make money short term mm -hmm. and the entire market crashes, mm -hmm. that's bad for any developer who, who's, who has invested in a multi-million dollar property that can't find anyone to live in it because they've overbuilt for a saturated market that doesn't actually exist in the city of New Orleans. And so we're on the precipice, you think, for, for being uh, in that category yes. of overbuilding? Yeah, for the high-end market? Yeah, Absolutely. the high-end market. Absolutely. Because that's what we see happening, especially that's, in downtown New Orleans. Exactly. And the again, the, with the transit issues that we have, we need to be settling people who work in the tourist, tourism industry in downtown. It's better for their employers. It's better for them. It's better for the city if those valued workers, the folks who are the backbone of this economy, can walk to work, can get to work quickly and effectively. Uh, and that, that's one of the things that we have to be talking about and we have to say to our develop, the development community, continue to join us because a lot of them have. A lot of them get it. They understand it. They support our efforts. They support this work uh, because we don't, again, we, uh, we mentioned mm -hmm. earlier the 10-year housing plan is about a huge collaboration of community members, of professional real estate developers, 
housing advocates and government officials working together and agreeing. So we have come together and agreed on the strategy, the timing of the strategy, what goes first, whose issue gets addressed first. Because mm -hmm. one of the criticisms that I would have of our efforts post-Katrina mm -hmm. was that we didn't prioritize. And, you know, and again, it's a hard conversation to say to a community, you guys have to wait until this community's issues have, have been addressed. That's a hard conversation to have. Previous administration didn't have it. Now we have to. So you think that that is one of the areas that you will be concentrating on uh, in the upcoming mayoral election, having this conversation move forward? Correct. That's it. Do you expect any pushback? Of course. <laughs> we, <laughs> we expect a lot of pushback. We, we understand that you know, there's concerns on multiple fronts when it comes to this election. And we are, while we're saying put housing first, we're not saying ignore other issues. But it is our belief that housing is a keystone issue. It is a foundation, if you'll pardon the pun, <laughs> to, uh, to these other issues. When we look at our crime initiatives, when mm -hmm. we look at education, when we look at job, job programs, we believe that those programs have not been as successful as they could have been because they were built on the rocky foundation that is housing insecurity in this community. And that's going back before Katrina. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you can, you, a child can be in the best school in the world, and if they have to go home at night and be worried about whether or not they're going to have somewhere to live, they're not going mm -hmm. to do well. Mm -hmm. you've got, you're on a, an employment track, you're on a career track, and you're living in your car, you're not going to be the best, you're not going to do the best at that job. You can, if you've been released from prison and you don't have somewhere to live, mm -hmm. it's likely that you're going to end up back in the same situation that, that puts you in prison. So if we can address housing, then we can build on addressing these other vital um, um, policies and initiatives that we need to make the city truly equitable. Andronisha and Morris, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It's Good. been an enlightening conversation. Thank you, Norman. Maybe you ought to put your hat in the ring for mayor. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. It's pretty crowded. All right. We'll be back with more affordable housing matters right after this. Don't go far. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I really want to know where my food's coming from. You'll find the difference in flavor is quite remarkable. The leaves are a lot more tender than the stalks yeah, and stems. absolutely. It's one of the easiest lamb recipes you'll ever try. It's avocado salsa turkey bacon burger. Make something delicious that you can share with friends, and you can enjoy the flavor throughout the entire year. Saturdays at 5 p.m. on WLAE. Please join us again next month as we talk to the executive director of the Louisiana Housing Corporation and also get some information on an organization that is not only interested in building homes, but also in building communities. And remember, if you would like to rewatch this and other episodes of Affordable Housing Matters, go to WLAE.com and click on Programming Link. There you can watch this episode and all past episodes of Affordable Housing Matters. As always, thank you for joining us. I'm Norman Robinson. Have a good night.